We're turning to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, just a few verses. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 24 to verse 27. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Some churches, maybe you can think of some in your mind, try really hard to appeal to the world outside their doors with really catchy slogans and witty phrases, nice visual aids on signs outside the building. Some of them are better than others. Rarely do those signs outside the church have the honesty of Paul. If they did, perhaps there would be signs outside churches saying things like, come to Christ and see how much you'll suffer for him. Or paraphrasing verse 24, an honest church slogan might be, rejoicing to suffer for Christ. And then people who are at least curious as to whether the church is just mad, they might walk in the door of that church. And if that church preaches the gospel, they would discover the reason for our joy amidst affliction. The reason why we rejoice to suffer for Christ is because the Messiah, God's promised savior for Israel, has come into the world as the savior for all the nations. This was a mystery for a long time, Paul says, but it's been revealed to anyone who reads the New Testament. Jesus is the international savior, and those he came to save now know his constant abiding presence within them by his spirit, who secures our future glory. The truth of the Christian life is that we are all slaves of Christ. And as our master, the Lord has a purpose for each one of us. Slavery to Christ, by the way, is the greatest calling in the world because it's freedom from the enslavement to sin in which we once walked. And now our master is not sin that kills, but the Lord of life. He died for our sins to bring us life to the full. Now he's called us to serve him, and that will entail suffering. But it's a joyous suffering because we're suffering for our Savior and his saints. We're suffering to reach as many as we can with the good news of Jesus Christ, and that should have its own unique joy. Paul delighted to be in this service for Christ's church. Paul was joyful to fulfill the suffering Christ promised him in order to fulfill the ministry God gave him. And if we also have the glorious mystery of Christ available to us, and we also have the joy of Christ in us, the hope of glory, then we too will be willing to suffer for him as part of our joyful service to our master. We're going to see this morning in verse 24 that there's a call to suffer and then there's a commission to serve, and then the Christ's salvation in verse 27. But first, the call to suffer. Richard's going to be preaching from the very passage tonight that tells us that Paul was made a minister of Christ. And in Acts chapter 9, a very hesitant Ananias is commanded by Jesus to go to Saul and restore his sight. But the Lord said to Ananias, we read, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. We all want to know God's will for our lives, don't we? We may not like to hear that it involves suffering. 
Jesus said Paul must suffer for his name. Not that he might, not that he could if he accepted the challenge. He must. And even while he wrote to the Colossian church, Paul was in prison for the gospel. But how does he consider that situation? A tremendous privilege. You see his joy in suffering. I want to tell you about a man this morning called Hamed. Hamed is a 31-year-old convert from Islam from Iran. In 2019, he was arrested and all of his Christian literature and his Bibles were taken. All of his computer hard drives were confiscated. And as well as enduring solitary confinement, he was interrogated. He was offered financial bribes for informing on other Christians. He was then released, but forced to attend these Islamic indoctrination classes. He refused to complete them. His case was delayed a long time, ostensibly due to COVID. And then he submitted himself to prison, declaring on a video, I thank God for considering me worthy of enduring this persecution because of him. Well, all Christians in some sense share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, 2 Corinthians 1.5. Jesus never gave any prospective follower the impression that being his disciple would be easy. The opposite is true. But those who suffer for Christ can do so with a, a joy that's hard to explain to an outsider. To them, it's baffling, even ridiculous, that we would suffer for our faith. That's because, according to verse 13 of Colossians 1, they belong to that dominion of darkness. They can't see the light that we have. Suffering is inevitable for the disciple of Christ because it was promised to us. Jesus told his followers we'd have tribulations in this world. And when Paul wrote, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and for the sake of his body, the church. He's following on from verse 23 where he mentions the gospel hope that he's a minister of. That's why he has joined his sufferings because he trusts that through those sufferings, people will hear the gospel. Whenever we grasp the wonder of the good news afresh, we will see how suffering to serve Christ is the most amazing way we could spend our lives. Now, having said that, there are ways that we can avoid suffering as a Christian. Keep your mouth shut every time God gives you an opportunity to witness to a colleague a neighbor, a family member, or a friend. Avoid the awkwardness of standing up and saying, no, I'm not going to wear a rainbow lanyard because my boss mandated it for Pride Month. If opportunities to serve in the local church outreach or overseas missions team arise, you could choose to stay home, stay warm, cozy, and safe, and you'll not suffer financially. There are many ways we can try to avoid suffering, but if we spend our lives as Christians trying to avoid suffering for the faith, what will we have to present to our master when he returns? Let us not be like the servant who hid the talents his master gave to him, whom Jesus called a wicked and slothful servant, but let us strive to be like the servant who invested the talents whom Jesus replied to with the words that every Christian longs to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Hiding from suffering as a Christian is really hiding from service. R.T. France says it represents a discipleship which consists of playing safe and so achieving nothing. Being ready consists not only in keeping your slate clean, but in active, responsible, faithful service. So why would we willingly suffer? Well, let's think about Paul's motivation for suffering. Paul was filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. That might sound strange or even wrong, but that's what the Spirit revealed to the apostles, so we need to try and understand it. This verse, this second half of verse 24, has 
been misread by many people. It's divided interpreters throughout history. But it's not so confusing because we know what it can't mean. It can't mean what Roman Catholics claim, that Christ's death was insufficient for atonement. And we must suffer further in life and maybe purgatory too before entering into his glory. No, Christ suffered once for all for sins. And this entire epistle that Paul wrote talks about his sufficiency. Others say that Paul's unique calling including, included suffering more than any other saint. And that may be true, but it's not his point. He's not saying, feel sorry for me. I suffer way more than anyone else. Others say he was suffering on behalf of the Colossian church. He's trying to deflect persecution away from a young church to let them grow in the faith. But none of these are compelling answers. So what does this phrase mean to fill up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, by looking at other texts, we can better appreciate Paul's point. And just as a side note, that's a good principle for interpreting any scripture that's difficult or seemingly obscure. You want to interpret the obscure passage in light of clearer ones. So Philippians chapter 129, to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.5, I read earlier, we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ. So there's only one thing about Christ's tribulations, that's what this word means, that we can speak of as lacking. And that is, there were more to come. He promised all who identify with him would suffer too. Christ's suffering for sin is not lacking, but nowhere in the New Testament is this word used to speak of that kind of suffering for sin. It's not about that. But in the sense that Jesus identifies with his church as his body, we've not suffered all that we must yet. Remember what Jesus said to Saul in Acts 9. Why are you persecuting the church? No, he didn't say that. He said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul didn't even know who Jesus was, so how could he have been persecuting him? Because Jesus, the head, identifies with his body, the church. We are in him because he's first in us. And his enemies are not satisfied with their attacks against Christ. So they keep attacking him however they can, namely by attacking his servants. Our suffering for Christ is a way that we are identified with Christ. We will suffer if we're serving Christ and his people. We will suffer if we refuse to compromise biblical teaching, matters such as those things concerning the start of life, the end of life, marriage, sexuality, and gender. We'll suffer if we refuse to submit to government when they overreach their God-given authority. And crucially, we'll suffer if we tell sinful people that they're dead in their sins, hopelessly lost on a no-return journey to hell, and Christ alone is the exclusive means of salvation if they repent and turn in faith to him. But we must tell them and we mustn't stop there. It's the complete word of God that we must proclaim. Spreading this essential truth was the reason for Paul's suffering, and ours too, with joy. It wasn't only religious suffering that Paul suffered. We know he had physical afflictions too. Maybe you won't be persecuted in direct ways, but you will suffer. That suffering may be inward. In fact, it will be the daily spiritual battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. But if we understand our sufferings properly, we will find reasons to maintain a joy in the spirit because we recognize that as we struggle, as we suffer, we're displaying an evidence of our unity with Christ. There's evidence that the old order of things is passing away and our hope of glory is getting closer each and every day. It's still crucial to do what you can for the Lord in the strength he gives you, even as you suffer. 
W.E. Sangster was a 1950s British minister. And one day he was diagnosed with an incurable disease and it caused him progressive muscular atrophy. And so his muscles wasted away. His voice gradually failed him and it became hard for him to swallow. Despite this, he continued his work for British Home Missions because he could still write and he had more time to pray. And so he prayed, keep me in the struggle, Lord. With his books and his prayer cells around England, he suffered on for Christ. And then one Easter morning when his voice was completely gone and he could only shakily hold a pen, he wrote this in a letter to his daughter. It is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice to shout, he is risen. But it would still be more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. That godly perspective challenges me all the time. The minister wanted to shout because he rejoiced in being united to Christ, even if it caused him suffering and great pain, physically and no doubt spiritually. But he trusted God's will for him. And he continued to suffer for the sake of those who hadn't yet come to faith. Paul was motivated to suffer for the edification, the building up of Christ's body. In Philippians 1.13, Paul said, It's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. And to Corinth, he wrote, For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the key. When we're suffering in the Lord's work, we're more dependent on him for strength and less on ourselves. And we can always be sure that he'll provide all that we need to serve him faithfully. There is a call to suffer. But secondly, Paul talks about his commission to serve. Verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. I wonder if you can remember a time when your parents went away, maybe on holiday, maybe not for as long as that, maybe just an afternoon, and they left you to manage the house while they were away. You never became the owner or the master of the house, that you like to think that you were, but you were given a responsibility to serve your parents like the manager of the house in their absence. Paul calls himself a minister and a steward here, and it's the third time in this chapter that he said he's a minister. Remember, that word is diakonos, deacon. So what? So one, he's a servant, not the master, and two, he didn't give himself his ministry. God called him and commissioned him to serve. And so it is with us. The word steward means household management. But the house that Paul was to steward for his master was the mystery of the gospel. He was to reveal it through publicly preaching the fullness of God's word and through writing epistles, which are themselves God's word. He says his ministry is for you, for the church in Colossae. And that's important because we've all been given a stewardship of spreading the gospel for others. But we've also been given gifts to steward too. And our spiritual gifts were not given primarily for our benefit, but for mutually building up our brothers and sisters. And so the Apostle Peter says, as each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's buried grace. And like Paul, we'll all have to give an answer for how we've stewarded the ministry that God's given us. The commission that we have received, if we're trusting in Christ, is from the Almighty God. So it can't be ignored. We are all his servants in the church. None of us are masters. Our master builds the church. But in his grace... He has appointed ministers to serve it. Are you actively working in this service? Do you care enough for the needs of your brothers and sisters in the church to ask them how they are? To see if there's some way you can help them? 
to see how you can pray for them maybe? Or do you think you're an insignificant member of God's church? Well, there is no such thing as an insignificant member of the body. Remember who called you, who lives in you, and who sends you out to share the good news with the world and to encourage your family. Paul's commission was to make the word of God fully known or present the word of God in its fullness, another translation has. He talked about filling up in verse 24. And from that same word, he talks about making God's word fully known in verse 25. He's saying, my sufferings are filled up so that the church's knowledge of God may be filled up. His point is, he knows that suffering for the church is a way for him to fulfill his ministry. It's part of God's plan for him to spread the gospel across the world. But Christian ministry can be exhausting because it often demands that we empty ourselves in order to fill up those we serve. But this is the call, and it's one that Paul obeys gladly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> One day, we'll all be required to give an account of the work that we've been given to do. Ministers of Scripture, we will have a special responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. But even if you're not given that calling, you'll still have to give an account of your service as disciples of Christ. Maybe you remember in school, like I do, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I think we're still here. voice is still here. You might get a whispered third point, but we'll keep going. <clears throat> I can remember at school preparing for exams. Some of you are doing that perhaps. And as you're studying, some good teachers will tell you that you need to study as hard as you can to in order to remember as much information as possible. But if you studied hard enough, you can be satisfied if you've done your best, no matter what the result may be. Even if the results turn out badly, you can be satisfied because you put the work in. We are all weak, clearly I am today, weak and fragile individuals working alongside other weak and fragile individuals to fulfill the commission that God has given us. But we have a real motivation for service, for suffering, and that comes in our last point, the Christ's salvation. What is this mystery that's been hidden for ages that to us, to the church, God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mystery is the second most profitable literary genre my wife has often enjoyed the gripping tales of Agatha Christie's Poirot, and from time to time I do as well. Twice Paul reveals the content of a mystery, one that's now been revealed to all Christians, not a select few. He's not speaking so much of a, a mystery that is something completely kept secret. Like a good murder mystery, which leaves these clues throughout the chapters that lead up to the end, so God's Spirit revealed in part what this mystery entailed in the chapters of the Old Testament. And as detectives <clears throat> must follow the evidence closely, so we can trace clues through the Old Testament. We can see from the prophets that God had always indicated the promised Christ was going to redeem a people from every nation, not just Israel. So specifically, what is this mystery? Verse 27 says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now Paul's speaking to a church 
They're made up mostly of Gentiles. And he's trying to encourage them with a scope of God's amazing grace. Ephesians would be the book that's most similar to Colossians in our New Testament. And we can turn there for clarity. Because Ephesians 3 expands this point further. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The mystery only revealed in the New Testament fully is that Gentiles are welcomed into one united people of God without becoming Jews, but through faith in Christ Jesus for forgiveness of sins. God's Messiah is revealed to all who are welcomed into the family of God by faith. The heretics who are trying to mislead the Colossians probably claimed to have a hidden, secret, mysterious knowledge. And they're the only ones who could divulge it. Now, that's really important for the context of this book, but it's also important for us today. Why do we need to be aware of those who claim to have a new mystery, from God even? Well, many Christian, small c, best-selling books claim similar newfound insights, and they allure the undiscerning astray. I put two of the biggest examples of my generation on the screen. 2004 book, Jesus Calling, written by a false prophetess, Sarah Young, and she says that she receives letters from Jesus, and he wants her to write them and then sell them to us in her book. And she has some fresh revelation. I've seen this book in church bookshelves. A much more honest title would have been Another Jesus Calling. She doesn't present the biblical Jesus. The most famous, perhaps, would be The Shack, whose author states that every human being is saved by Christ's death and resurrection, that Jesus is lower than the Father and the Spirit, and that God doesn't really punish sin, certainly not in hell. The fact that these are so-called Christian bestsellers shows us that even today, we can be tempted to fall for claims to secret new knowledge. So I want us to listen to what Paul says about the mystery of the gospel. If you could turn briefly to 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians chapter two and verse six. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The gospel is sufficient to declare the hidden wisdom of God to his children. We don't need anything else. The plan of salvation and the way to receive it have been made known to us. God has chosen to make known to us that whoever turns from their sin, surrenders to Christ as Lord, he will come and dwell in them, securing their hope of glory. In the past, the Old Testament prophets did declare that God's Messiah and his people Israel would be a light for the Gentiles. Why? That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. In Leviticus, he said to Israel that he would make his dwelling with them and walk among them. But now the fullness of that promise is revealed as the church, not only believing Jews, but Gentiles too, can know God's indwelling presence. This was relatively new information for those in Colossae, but not for us. And so it's easy for us to miss the significance and the awe of this mystery that we who were once far away 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In his immeasurable grace and love, God has placed his spirit within believers. Christ is in us as the hope of glory. This is still profound truth for us today. We can summarize the the vastness of Paul's mystery in three sentences. God's salvation has been revealed in his perfect timing. God's favor and mercy is extended to include both Jews and Gentiles in his new covenant. And God's promise of glory is certain for all who believe in his son. And that third reality is our ongoing hope. Because Christ rose from the dead, we too will be raised in glory. We have a future final hope that is as sure as the life in our Lord Jesus. So how does all of this affect our day-to-day service, our lives as servants? Well, it should be our daily hope that fuels our service. It should be our daily motivation to suffer in serving our Savior. And it should be daily cause for praise and wonder that the holy and just judge of all the earth And his immense grace has not dealt with us according to what our sins deserve, but in his grace. And knowing the mystery that Christ is in us gives us daily confidence that though we can do nothing in our own strength, we don't need to because he's always with us. Next slide, please, Charles. Um, It's frustrating me looking at those bits. (laughs) That's okay, don't worry. I just had those points up there daily hope that fuels our service and daily motivation to suffer in service and daily cause for praise. In between my first and second year at college, I was given the opportunity to work for a furniture company and I was delighted. Then I remembered that I had no experience in DIY. I'd never even built any IKEA flat pack tables before. So whenever I was very quickly given this uh, opportunity and I was told to to build something for a company or firm or a a private client, I got very nervous. Usually I'd only seen the thing built once before and I was terrified. But if my experienced colleague was there and he was overseeing my effort and helping me, I felt more reassured, obviously. Well, Paul has declared that Christ is in his people. This means that None of our Christian efforts are solo efforts. It comforts the pastor as much as it does the newest disciple. Because it means wherever we are on our journey as followers of Christ, we are not alone in the battle as we suffer to serve him. This is good news for the church of Colossae and for every believer through the ages. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. It's a continual abiding that Jesus promises. Christ in you is the only guarantee you need to be assured that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It's the only guarantee you need to be assured that he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells within you. And Christ in you is the only guarantee you need that your new body, in your new body, you will obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is why we rejoice to suffer in serving Christ. It's an Olympic year, isn't it? Imagine if all of the trainers of those Olympic athletes were not permitted to travel to Paris. They weren't allowed to physically be with their athletes this summer. Sure, they could video call their colleagues, but being with them presently gives them an incomparably better support and joy. Now, expand that weak illustration infinitely. The Lord's not far from any one of his children. 
up there in heaven with only a limited contact with us as we suffer. No, he's with us presently and he never leaves us. So we rejoice in our sufferings because in them we're drawn closer to our master and we're confident that he is with us. And in our life of gospel service, he is in us. And that's our hope of glory to come. Amen. We'll close by singing.